Uh, just find a chapter. <laughs> it's probably on your sheet, isn't it? All right. Eight, thank you. I forgot my, I forgot my paper and crayon at home, so. <laughs> Joshua chapter number eight. We're moving like right along through the book of Joshua. We've been gone for three weeks, uh, Sunday nights so through Joshua. And so I hope you remember what we last studied. <laughs> what is it? Kind of aching about it. We talk about a cure for the aching heart, remember? The defeat that Israel suffered at AI in chapter number uh, 7. And um, we're going to pick up in chapter number 8 this evening. Uh, it's a longer chapter, um, chapter 35 verses there. Um, I'm not sure if I put all 35 on the screen here or not, but I think I did, and that's fine, uh, because we want to kind of get the whole context of the, of the chapter. We're kind of familiar with, you know, most of the accounts, but it kind of points out a few things we want to look at this evening. Uh, but we want to look at, after we, after we suffered our defeat in Ai last week, and of course this whole uh, Canaan is not heaven, we're talking about the victorious Christian life that we should be experiencing now in our daily lives, um, how do we ambush our Ai? Uh, AI is that kind of that, I uh, remember Israel went into battle and got defeated by a smaller army, and of course most of that was attributed to the fact they didn't go in God's name or in God's power and God's help, they did it on their own, uh, and how do, we, how do we come back from that, because we all do it, we all do it from time to time. Uh, how do we come back from that great defeat? And that's what we want to kind of look at in chapter number 8 tonight. Uh, Israel is going to face the same city that they faced in chapter 7, the little bitty tiny city of Ai. Uh, it's the one they went to battle against uh, on their own, lost 36 of their military members. Uh, they were defeated soundly, ran back home crying and, and, and weakened uh, by this defeat. Uh, and, of course, sin was in the camp. And if you remember, uh, Achan uh, had the issue uh, of the, 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 the stealing of the, of the things from Jericho. Uh, and now Israel is going to go back and do battle against with these people once again. Um, the, the, the word AI, it's not artificial intelligence. Uh, just, so, just, just so that we're all clear, that wasn't yet quite accomplished in Joshua. That comes later on in like Second Kings or something like that, I think. But uh, uh, it says not artificial intelligence. But the word AI actually means a heap of ruins. A heap of ruins. Uh, and by the way, uh, when you think about AI in the Bible, it's also a picture of the flesh of man. Okay? And then that's a good way to describe the flesh. A heap of ruins, right? Uh, and, and so as we think about that tonight, uh, the mention of this city is found in Genesis. Uh, it's in connection with the life of Abraham back in Genesis chapter 12 and 13. And the Bible tells us that Abraham pitched his tent between Bethel and Ai. Um, the word Bethel means the house of God. Okay? And, and so you think about the Christian life, the victorious Christian life we should be experiencing has a lot to do with the house of God, right? Uh, and, and the flesh that we're constantly fighting in our lives is that, is that heap of ruins, right? And we're right in the middle, okay? Uh, which one am I going to live for? Uh, which one am I going to pursue? Which one am I going to be more victorious in, the flesh or the spirit? And, and so I want to look at this battle with AI tonight and, and show you from, from Israel's account here how to ambush our AI, okay? So Joshua chapter number 8, and if you found that, and you're able to, stand with us out of respect for the reading of God's Word. Uh, I think we'll read the whole chapter. Uh, if you need to be seated partway through, go ahead. The Lord understands that. Uh, but if you can stand, we'll do that. Give you the last chance to stretch your legs, and then we'll uh, pray and be seated as soon as we're done, all right? Joshua 8, look at verse 1. The Lord said unto Joshua, Fear not, neither be thou dismayed. Take all the people of war with thee. Wow. First thing he tells them is don't be afraid, right? Because they just got whooped by these people. And then he tells them, well, take the whole army this time, knuckleheads. Don't take your little small remnant because you think you can do something. All right, take them all. Take them all. Uh, arise and go up to Ai. See, I have given into thine hand the king of Ai, his people, and his city, and his land. Now, we might come back to that a little bit if I remember to in the message. But you notice what God says there? God doesn't say, I will give unto you. I, I might give. He said, I've already given it. It's your, isn't that nice to know that when God says uh, you can have victory, you can have victory, right? Uh, it's already been provided. Look verse 2. And thou shalt do to Ai and her king as thou didst unto Jericho and her king. Only the spoil thereof uh, and the cattle thereof shall ye take for a prey unto yourselves. 
lay thee in, am, in ambush for the city behind it. So Joshua rose and all the people of war to go up against Ai. And Joshua chose out 30,000 mighty men of valor and sent them away by night. And he commanded them, saying, Behold, ye shall lie in wait against the city, even behind the city. Go not very far from the city, but be ye all ready. And I and all the people that are with me will approach into the city. And it shall come to pass when they come out against us, as at the first, that we will flee before them. For they will come out after us till we have drawn them from the city. For they will say, They flee before us, as at the first. Therefore we will flee before them. Then you shall rise up from the ambush and seize upon the city, for the Lord your God will deliver it into your hand. And it shall be while you have taken the city that you shall set the city on fire. According to the commandment of the Lord shall you do. See, I have commanded you. Joshua therefore sent them forth, and they went to lie in ambush and abode between Bethel and Ai, on the west side of Ai. But Joshua lodged that night among the people. And Joshua rose up early in the morning and numbered the people, and went up, he and the elders of Israel, before the people of Ai. And all the people, even the people of war that were with him, went up and drew nigh and came before the city and pitched on the north side of Ai. Now there was a valley between them and Ai. And he took about 5,000 men and set them to lie in ambush between Bethel and Ai on the west side of the city. And when they had set uh, the people, even all the hosts that was on the north of the city, and their liars and wait on the west of the city, Joshua went that night into the midst of the valley. And it came to pass when the king of Ai saw it, that they hasted and rose up early. And the men of the city went out against Israel to battle, he and all his people, at a time appointed before the plain. But he wist not that there were liars in ambush against him behind the city. And Joshua and all Israel made as if they were beaten before them and fled by the way of the wilderness. And all the people that were in Ai were called together to pursue after them. And they pursued after Joshua and were drawn away from the city. And there was not a man left in Ai, Bethel, or Bethel that went not after Israel. And they left the city open and pursued after Israel. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Stretch out thy spear uh, that is in thy hand towards Ai, for I will give it unto thine hand. And Joshua stretched out the spear that he had in his hand toward the city. And the ambush uh, arose quickly out of their place. Uh, and they ran as soon as he had stretched out his hand, and they entered into the city. And took it and hastened to set the city on fire. And when the men of Ai looked behind them, they saw, and behold, the smoke of the city ascended up to heaven. And they had no power to flee this way or that way. And the people that fled to the wilderness turned back upon the pursuers. And when Joshua and all of Israel saw that the ambush had taken the city, and that the smoke of the city ascended, that they turned again and slew the men of Ai. And the other uh, issued out of the city against them. So they were in the midst of Israel, some on this side and some on that side. And they smote them so that they let none of them remain or escape. And the king of Ai they took alive and brought him to Joshua. And it came to pass when Israel had made an end of slaying all the inhabitants of Ai in the field, in the wilderness wherein they chased them. And when they were all fallen on the edge of the sword until they were consumed... That all the Israelites returned unto Ai and smote it with the edge of the sword. And so it was that all that fell that day, both men and women, were 12,000, even all the men of Ai. For Joshua drew not his hand back, wherewith he stretched out the spear, until he utterly destroyed all the inhabitants of Ai. Only the cattle and the spoil of the city Israel took for a prey unto themselves, according to the word of the Lord which he commanded unto Joshua. Uh, and Joshua burnt Ai and made it in heap forever. Even a desolation unto this day. And the king of Ai, he hanged on a tree until eventide. And as soon as the sun was down, Joshua commanded they should take his carcass down from the tree and cast it at the entering of the gate of the city and raise thereon a great heap of stones that remaineth unto this day. Then Joshua built an altar unto the Lord God of Israel in Mount Ebal. As Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded the children of Israel, as is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of whole stones, of which no man hath lifted up any iron, and they offered thereupon uh, burnt offerings unto the Lord, and sacrificed peace offerings. And he wrote there upon the stones a copy of the law of Moses, which he wrote in the presence of the children of Israel. And all Israel, and their elders, and officers, and their judges, stood on the side of the ark, and on that side which the priests of the Levites, which bear uh, the ark of the covenant of the Lord, as well as the, uh, the stranger, as he that was born among them, half of them over against Mount Gerizim, half of them over against Mount Ebal, as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded before that they should bless the people of Israel. 
And afterward, he read all the words of the law, the blessings and cursings, according to all that is written in the book of the law. There was not a word of all that Moses commanded, which Joshua read not before all the congregation of Israel with the women and the little ones and the strangers that were conversant among them. And let's pray together. Father, we thank you tonight for your love and goodness. Thank you for the Bible. Uh, we thank you for this account of victory uh, in the Israelites' lives, Lord, and the victory that we too can have in our lives if we'll follow uh, some of these biblical prescriptions. And Father, we thank you for the time we've had to sing and hear the praises of your people tonight and from our missionaries. And uh, we just pray now as we continue our service that you'll bless the time of preaching and teaching this evening. Uh, may it be helpful to us, challenging to us, Lord, as we think about the ambush uh, of our AI. Lord, we pray that you will speak. We pray that you will use the service now in our lives. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. I love this passage of scripture. Do you notice? Do you notice the one of the first things I notice when I read this passage is that is the distinction between what Joshua did and what Saul did. Because if you remember, Saul was commanded to uh, uh, take take a nation and totally and utterly destroy them, right? And, and the king and everything. And, and Saul did the exact opposite. You notice Joshua was obedient, right? You notice Joshua got victory, and Joshua got blessing, and Joshua got all the accolades, and Saul had nothing but defeat and problems the rest of his life. Uh, you, see the, you see the direct uh, difference between the two accounts. As we think about this particular passage here in Joshua chapter 8, and we think about uh, the ambush that they laid on Ai, and we talk about that tonight, I want us to remember that, again, there are times in our lives where we have to follow a biblical, uh, spiritual formula to defeat the old man. Uh, and that's what we want to kind of focus on tonight is the flesh, the AI that you and I have to deal with on a regular basis. So as we look at this passage, let me give you a few thoughts this evening. Uh, the first thing I want to point out, and we saw that in the very first verse that we read, the victory is promised. The victory is promised. Uh, as you think about victory, I say this a lot, and I will continue to say this until I die, okay? I like to win. Yeah. Amen. Amen? I don't like to lose at anything. Uh, and if you like to lose and you're okay with that, what do I say? You're a loser, right? Uh, <laughs> I like to win, all right? Winning is great. Winning is fun. Winning is rewarding. Uh, here's the thing as, is, as Christians we need to understand. We can be victorious in our Christian lives. This is not something that God says, I want you to do, but by the way, you probably can't. Uh, we, we, are, we are guaranteed victory as well when we follow the biblical formula on getting victory in our lives. So as you think about victory, I want to give you a couple of thoughts. First of all, I want to give you a word about winning. When the Lord speaks to Joshua after the death of, of, of Achan and that sin is taken care of there, uh, he tells him this time things are going to be different. He assures Joshua and Israel, victory is coming. I've given you the land already. I'm sending you into the land to do battle, but the victory already been given. Isn't that awesome about God? And you realize the same thing is true with our, with our spiritual Christian lives in this area of victory. God has promised us victory already. When I suffer defeat, it ain't his fault. When I suffer defeat, it's because I let AI get in the way. I let the flesh, the heap of ruins get in the way. Uh, and, and, I, and I mess some things up. Uh, and I allow my flesh uh, to get victory over me. I, I love the phrasing again we see though in those first couple of verses. He, he tells Joshua, fear not. Fear not. Now remember, he's sending the men back into the battle of the city that just whooped them. The city that just gave them their first sound defeat. And I know they only sent a portion of their army, but they still suffered defeat. They are probably having that run through their minds as they're getting ready to go and face the same city once again. He says, fear not, I'm giving you the victory. The victory is secure. The victory is taken care of. You know, I'm thankful that God has promised his children victory. Amen? Uh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? <laughs> Uh, we, you know, we don't have to worry about that in our Christian lives. God has given us the victory already, and, and we're thankful for that. A word about winning. Let me, uh, let me remind you, Jesus didn't save you uh, so that you could go to heaven but live a miserable, lonely, depressed, defeated Christian life. The Bible says very clearly he came to give life and to give it more abundantly. That's the victory he's promised us. Uh, a word about winning. Let me give you number two, a word about waiting. A word about waiting. Uh, notice that the Lord tells uh, them exactly what they're going to do in Ai. Uh, and he says, you're going to do uh, what you did to Jericho. Except in Ai, you, I got a little bit of something different for you. You get to take the goods. You get to keep the cattle. 
You get to keep the riches. You get to bring that all back as spoils for yourself and for your army. You know, I think about that, and you know the first thing that comes to my mind is, and you might not think about this, but the first thing that comes to my mind, what if Achan had just waited? That dude, that dude stole the spoils he was told not to take, cost him and his family their lives, and had he just waited, God had something better in store. Y'all, y'all, y'all with me here? Because when I don't wait on God, I get ahead of God, I suffer the defeat, I, I face the consequences, and then God brings something better into my life anyways, and if I would have just waited, I would have had to suffer the defeat in the first place. And we see that here in Israel, we see that here through Achan as well. Uh, I'm not willing to wait on God. Well, how many times are we reminded that, that my timing is not God's timing? And my ways and my thoughts are not his ways and his thoughts, Right? And how many times, oh, oh, Christian, how many times do I get ahead of God? Because here's the thing about our flesh. I want something, I crave something, I want something, I need something, I want something, and I want it now. Right? We pray for patience. God, give me patience and give it to me now. Right? Come on. And so many times I get ahead of God in so many different areas of my life. And if I would just wait, the results I get from waiting are better than the temporary results I might have gotten when I got ahead of God. Better than the defeat I might have suffered. Wait on God. You know, we teach our, t- our, our kids, hopefully, you know, we teach our kids and our teenagers, you know, wait, wait on a mate. God has one for you. If that's his intention for you to get married, he's got the mate already there. Wait on God. Wait on God. Uh, wait on God in the area of sexuality. Wait on God in the area of finances. Wait on God in, in, in the area of ministry. There are so many areas that we just need to wait on God. Because if we'll wait on God, victory is assured. If we'll wait on God, the end results are always better than when I get ahead of God or than when I drag my feet on God. Wait on God. Victory is promised. Number two. Number two. Here, here's what you're going to find out, okay? Joshua is told by God, victory is yours. Joshua tells the people, let's go into battle. Victory is ours. But the people still had to do something. They didn't just sit there and say, well, God said we got victory. What did they have to do? They, hold on. My clicker, my clicker broke, Larry. <laughs> See, we haven't, had, we haven't had any problems today. There we go. Oh, I, got it. I think it was, the, it was the program, wasn't it? I think the program locked up on him. There we go. Now we're, oh, now I got to go through 35 verses. Oh, you getting me there? All right, he's, Larry's going to get us there. Let's all, let's all turn around and look at Larry. <laughs> I'm on point number two. Oh, nope, I'm locked up again. Where's my, where's my, where's my uh, overhead projector in my laminate? Uh, <laughs> How many of you remember those things? Man, they were great when, they were, when, when that's all we had. But man, you don't want one now, do you? There we go. Larry's got us rolling. There we go. Let's go back up to number two. There we go. They're promised the victory, but the victory wasn't just there. They had to pursue it. They had to do what God said to do. You know, the same thing is true. God's guaranteed us. God has assured us victory and victory in our Christian lives, but we got to do something. Okay? We don't get to just stand there and say, well, God promised, so I'll just sit here and do nothing. No. <laughs> There's some pursuing in our lives that has to take place. If you look at the victory being pursued, look at a couple things because this is great. They had God's plan. This ambush that they were about to lay, I, I, although, although Joshua lays this out for them, and you think now, think, you think about it, goes, what a genius strategy, right? This wasn't Joshua's strategy. This wasn't his military general's strategy. This was God's plan. God said, hey, Joshua, here's what you're going to do. Boy, isn't that, that neat to know that God's a lot smarter than we are? <laughs> Isn't he? He's a lot smarter than we are. This is God's plan. He gives them in detail exactly how they're going to mount their attack. They're to lay this ambush. They're to wait, call the inhabitants out, see the battle, run from the enemy. And when they get out, burn the city, come up from both sides, destroy the enemy. God's plan. God's plan. Israel had already learned what happens when you do things God's way. They've already experienced this many times. Now they're going to see it once again. Do it God's way. Success is there. Do it God's way. Uh, uh, victory is guaranteed. And you know, the same thing is true in our Christian lives. Uh, when we do it God's way, victory is there. Again, we're talking about fighting the flesh. Uh, victory over the flesh, the AI, the, the, the heap of ruins in our lives. Uh, you know, the, the, the victory over the flesh can come, but we've got to stay in constant contact with the plan of God. 
uh, when you got saved, you know, you became a new creature. But the old man didn't go away. We're still battling the flesh, okay? And, and so to battle the flesh, I follow God's formula. I follow God's plan. Uh, th there's several things that we need to realize. There are things that God has given us that play a huge part of his plan in giving me victory over, over the flesh. These are simple. These are, this is a Sunday night crowd. This is maybe even too simple for y'all, okay? But let me give them to you. The word of God. That's part of his plan to give me victory. Pastor Wood spoke very well on this Wednesday night. If you weren't here, watch the video. He spoke very well on the importance of the Word of God. And, and, and not just reading it, but studying it and meditating on it. And, and, and hiding it in our hearts. And then allowing it to shine through us to others. Okay? Great! The Word of God is as valuable in me getting victory over the flesh. That's why he gave it to us. He didn't give it to us to sit on the, on the shelf and collect dust and just bring it once a week to church on Sunday. Okay? He gave it to us to read, to study, to apply, to learn from, to grow. Uh, and, and it gives us victories. That's part of God's plan. Prayer. Again, this, I'm telling you, this is, this is, these are simple thoughts. But I think there are thoughts every now and then we need to be reminded of the simplicity of things. Amen? Prayer. Prayer is one of those things that helps us get victory over the flesh. Because when I'm weak, isn't it good to know that he's always strong? And when I'm going through a time where I know I can't make it, and I don't know what I'm going to do, that he has a plan. And if I can talk to him and communicate with him, he can relay that plan and help me through those times. Prayer. Church attendance. I, yeah, I know this is simple, and you're here. I'm not, I'm not preaching at you. I'm saying that's part of God's plan. Why? Because there are so many things we can do within the church that we can't do if we're not within the church. And then we have a fellowship of, of believers, this faith community that we get to grow with and love on and serve and minister with each other. And it becomes part of getting victory in our Christian lives. How, how about just the fellowship of the saints? Because here, here's, my, here's my thought, and I, and I don't always say this is my thought and, I, and I'm right, and if you disagree, you're wrong. But I'm right on this, and if you disagree, you're wrong. The church is not just some place to come on Sunday and say, okay, well, we, did our, we did our thing. The church is supposed to happen outside of the church as well. Y'all with me? Uh, the fellowship of the saints is not just a Sunday morning thing or a Sunday night thing or a Wednesday night thing. Uh, there, there ought to be fellowship and going on with the saints of God everywhere. I don't know how many times I've been at Walmart, man. We had like a church service at Walmart. I run into like nine people. I was like, all right, it's all gather in aisle five. Aisle five. <laughs> you know? And, and, and here's the thing. When you love your brothers and sisters in Christ, you want to fellowship outside the church. You want to go out to eat occasionally. You want to go uh, to the shooting range. Amen? You want to share some bacon every now and then, right? Come on. You don't share bacon with everybody, but the fellowship of the saints should be a bacon sharing opportunity. Amen? Amen. <laughs> and so, so this is part of God's plan. This is how I get victory over my Christian life. I add in all the things that God has in his plan to help me defeat my stinking ugly old flesh. Because I can't do it by myself. I've got to follow God's plan. Uh, all those things in and of themselves may not give you victory. But when you compile them all together, they strengthen your walk with God. They strengthen and, and further you in your growth and your relationship with God. And they help you get the victory that you so badly desire and crave in your Christian life. They had God's plan. Secondly, notice this. They had God's power. They had God's power. Uh, verse 18 through 23. Uh, Israel fought the battle, but it was God who gave the victory. Uh, it was God who gave the victory. Uh, the first time they went to Ai, they went on their own power, remember? They didn't consult God at all. They sent part of their army. They knew they could handle this. And, of course, they were sent in the camp as well. And, and what happened? Miserable, terrible, humiliating defeat was suffered. This time they went to battle knowing this. God has sent us. God has gone before us. God has given us the battle plan. And God has promised us the victory. That's how we're going this time. That's how we're going this time. You know, we all struggle with the flesh from time to time. The battle is never won because I have a strong will and I've learned to say no. The battle is never won because I'm determined I, I'm going to not give in. The battle is always won by the power of God. And the more I learn to lean on him to get me through those times of temptation and those times where my flesh raises its ugly head and, by the way, is still a powerful being in my life, the sooner I learn to depend on the power of God, the sooner I get to experience those victories in my Christian life. Uh, the victory was pursued. You know what if God had promised him? You got victory. And so the, the soldiers just said, okay, we'll sit and wait for it. I had to go and get it. Same thing's true spiritually, folks. 
You've been promised victory in your Christian life. You've been promised the abundant Christian life. You, you, you've been promised the ability to gain all of that. But you've got to go and get it. You've got, you got to pursue it. Israel pursued the victory. Look at number three. Number three. Uh, the victory is preserved. The victory is preserved. When I was young, I didn't know what it was. I do now, but I like preserves. Strawberry preserves. You like preserves? When somebody had said it before when I was a young kid, I was like, what? I like jelly. <laughs> I'll eat a little jam, right? And now it's like I'm sophisticated. I like preserves. Amen? Y'all with me? Now, don't put preserves on your okra. You'll ruin your preserves, all right? But, uh, <laughs> or your donut burger. Don't put preserves on that, all right? The victory was preserved. Here's the thing. Israel follows God's plan. That plan helped them to achieve victory. Now, they still have the rest of Canaan to conquer. They've got to maintain victory. They've got to keep victory. Uh, they take two steps that made this a reality for them. Uh, they, they trusted God. Uh, they, they followed his plan. They were obedient. They took those steps forward. But now they've got to maintain that victory. You know, I thought about that, and I couldn't help but think, if I'm going to maintain victory in my Christian life, I've got to follow the steps that God has for me in my life. And I've got to listen to his will. I've got to follow his will. I've got to be obedient to what he tells me to do. I thought about the victory that they preserved. And I want to give you a, a two thoughts here real quick. i got some points under one of them, so bear with me until I get to the second one, okay? And, and as I say this first one, you're going to be like, I don't, I don't, I don't understand. Number one, victory is preserved by death. You say, well, wait a minute. Well, yeah, ultimate victory. We get to go to heaven. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, I'm talking about victory in our, in our Christian life now as we're living, okay? Victory today is preserved by death. Do you notice when they, when they left the town of Ai, do you know how many people they left alive? None. Not a man, not a woman, not a child, not a king. None. None. The king, the humble servant, uh, unfortunately, the children all slew, 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 slowed, slayed, slayed, killed, all dead. Every one of them. Every one of them. Joshua knew something that, by the way, we see uh, several other times in Scripture, this, this plan was not followed. Uh, Joshua knew that the enemy had to be totally eradicated Amen. for victory to actually be claimed. Can I ask you a question? How many problems would we as a nation in the nation of Israel not have if people in Scripture had eradicated the people they were told to eradicate? Think, just think about it, all right? The lesson tonight is this. Your flesh is not dead. It's still alive, and it is still powerful and well, and it still likes to... To, to fight you, and I know there are preachers today, especially the ones on TV, they'll tell you, you know, you trust Jesus, and everything goes away, and the old, the flesh is gone, and you live under the power of God, you won't have any, they're lying to you, they're lying to you, uh, because the flesh is still there, uh, the flesh is still alive, the flesh is still working, the flesh is still fighting, the flesh is, 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 is not holy, the flesh is not righteous, the flesh hates God, uh, the flesh follows the father of lies, the devil himself. Uh, the flesh has those old sinful tendencies, that old sinful nature in our lives. We need to understand some things about our flesh if we're going to learn to have victory over it. And, and one of the things we have to understand is this. The flesh has to die for me to preserve the victory. Because the minute I allow my flesh to get the better of me, I've lost victory. I've lost victory. Now, we struggle with this from time to time. I know that. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not naive. We, we, we face these difficulties. And we lose the battle occasionally. Victory is preserved by death. So in knowing that, let me, let, me, let me give you a couple thoughts. And this might not be teaching the Sunday night crowd anything. You might already know this. Say, yeah, I've heard this, Pastor. Let's move on, all right? But let me teach you some things about the flesh. Number one, your flesh is alive and is at war with the Spirit of God. When you got saved, you became a new creature. The Spirit of God took up residence in your life. However, uh, the Apostle Paul, by the way, in Romans chapter 7, deals with this in great detail. Uh, we've been given a divine nature through the Holy Spirit of Christ, but the old nature is still there. And this is when you're, you know, uh, let me ask you, let me do another scientific uh, Calvary Baptist Church poll. We know these are 100% accurate and uh, all that kind of thing, okay? How many of you ever sin? 
<laughs> all right. All right. We all do, right? We all do. Do you realize why we sin? Because <laughs> we let the flesh get the victory. So constantly, daily, minute, mi minutely, can I say that? Minutely? Minute by minute. Thank you, Alice. I love it. Come, come here, Alice. Give me a hug. You know what Alice said? She said, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> Thank you, Alice. <laughs> minute by minute, second by second, the flesh is fighting. Why? Because the devil hates God. I, I, my flesh, when I got saved, I was pulled from the devil's family into God's family. Therefore, the flesh constantly wants to, uh, wants to fight God because the flesh and the devil doesn't want me to have the victorious Christian life that God wants me to have. They're constantly doing battle. How do, how do we get the flesh to not get the victory and allow the Spirit of God to get the victory? Well, it's all in the old Indian proverb, right? It's who you feed the most. Yeah, that's right. It's who you feed the most. Uh, who, who am I going to spend the most time fulfilling the desires of? The flesh or, or, or the will and the Spirit of God in my life. At the same time this is happening, we have to understand this principle as well. My flesh was crucified with Christ. Uh, this, is, this is my positional standing before God. When God sees me, he does not see my flesh. He sees Jesus Christ. And so in my accepting of Christ's sacrifice on Calvary for me, my flesh was nailed to the cross. Y'all with me? So, so my flesh was crucified with Christ. Uh, God reckoned the wicked, sinful nature that I possess to be killed and crucified with his son on the cross of Calvary. So knowing that my flesh is alive, but also knowing my flesh was crucified, now I'm left in a little bit of a conundrum. It seems like a contradiction, doesn't it? Wait a minute, you say the flesh is alive, but now you say the flesh is crucified. I'm lost, Pastor. I'm lost. Let me give you this number three. Number three. We have to put the flesh to death daily. It was crucified with Christ, and that's our position before God. Uh, this, this thought of putting our, our flesh to death daily, that's our practical responsibility before God. The position is Jesus sees us as Christ's son and his righteousness. My practical application of that is this. I have to get up every day and say, I'm going to kill my flesh today. I'm going to die to self today. I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think about some sin in my life and I'm saying, that's something I'm going to avoid today. God, I'm going to give you 100% of me. I've got to kill the flesh daily. We see that given to us in Colossians chapter 3. And, and in 10 verses, uh, there's a list of sins given. There's a list of sins given, and it talks about how we have to put the flesh to death to avoid these sins. And it, it brings up a list, and I, I just want to share them with you tonight. And you say, why this list? Why this list? And I can't help but think it's because this is the list, and if you look at our nation today, in the world, but also in the church, unfortunately, this seems to be the list that we struggle with the most. Now, again, all sickle and sin is you guys. I'm saying, I'm not saying these are the worst sins. I'm saying these are the ones we struggle with today, as well as back then when he, when he was presenting this to the church at uh, Colossae. Uh, look, look at a couple things. First of all, fornication. Fornication. This is illicit sexual activities. Uh, there's one appropriate place for the expression of our sexual appetite. And Bible says that's within the bounds of marriage. There's no gray area there like we talked about this morning. You all with me? That's what the scripture says. Uh, I know that's an old-fashioned attitude in today's day and age. And I know shacking up is just something people do these days, right? Right? I mean, that's just what they do. They say, oh, we've got to try it out first. I got, I got to, I, what, what is it? I got to, don't, don't buy the cow if the milk's free or something like that. I forget, I forget all the sayings, but I, I, we got a trial run. Well, we don't need that marriage thing. It's just, the Bible says, if you want to put the flesh to death, Fornication is one of those things we have to watch out for. Uh, uh, if I'm going to live to please, my uh, please God with my life, uh, I I've got to understand this thought of fornication, adultery. We can put in all those, a those, those other words if we want to. I've got to understand the impact that that has on my life. I will not ask anybody in this room to testify. Uh, you may know, you may know somebody who knows the dark side of the problems of sexual sin. If you, are, you, know, if you don't know somebody... Uh, there are plenty of people who would tell you, God delivered me from this, <laughs> and this is what I struggled with, and it was a, not a good time in my life. Uh, if I'm going to put the, to, to, to death daily the flesh, 
Fornication is one of those things. The second thing listed, in, in a, and again, this is in Colossians, uh, you, see, you see uncleanness. That's moral impurity. Doing things that are dirty and pollute my soul. Well, we struggle with that in America today, don't we? And I'm just going to go ahead and say it. This Sunday night crowd, so I doubt you'll get mad at me. We struggle with this in a lot of our churches today. <laughs> uncleanness. Uncleanness. The third thing he mentions is inordinate affections. Inordinate affections. These are passions uh, that are so intense for things that are forbidden by God. It's a desire and a craving for the wrong things. Uh, many times when you think of inordinate affections, uh, many people will even teach, as you compare scripture with some other scripture, will teach that's the homosexual crowd's movement. Uh, and that's an application of inordinate affections. These are all things that we struggle with today. These are all things that if I'm going to put my flesh to death daily, these are things I have to think about in that list. Amen. By the way, can I just say this real quick, just, just so that we're clear, okay? This is not Calvary Baptist Church's list of sins to avoid. Okay? This is what God, through the Apostle Paul, tells the church at Colossae. He's not speaking to a bunch of reprobate sinners at the library in town, at town hall meeting. He's preaching this to the church and saying, hey guys, church, you better wake up. Because this is taking place in the church. <laughs> Watch out. Watch out. He gives another one. Evil concupiscence. <laughs> <You're>, what? <laughs> What's that? Those are those evil desires. The yearning and the aching. I just got to do something evil. I desire, I crave to do something evil. Uh, it, it pulls us uh, in our desires and it causes us to grasp and to grab and to take hold of all kinds of forms of evil in our life that pleasure the body instead of pleasing God. Evil concupiscence. Let me just put this out there. This is a Sunday night crowd again, okay? So I don't think you're going to get mad. We're, we're about this far away from, from, from legalizing uh, pedophilia. Okay? That's the direction, sexually speaking, our nation is heading. Y'all with me? You know what that is? That's evil concupiscence. That's evil concupiscence. And, and we say, well, I, I would never... Oh, don't, de, 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 de. I guarantee you David stepped on his roof when he sent the men to battle and said, I would never, and he did. The minute I think I won't is when I do, amen? And so we're warned about this as Christians and as a church. If I'm going to put the, the, the flesh to death daily, these are some of the top things i got to think about and, and come to terms with. Covetousness is on the list. You say, wait a minute, <laughs> wait a minute. All those dirty, filthy, wicked sexual sins and now covetousness? You know what leads to most of those dirty, filthy sexual sins? Covetousness, <laughs> right? I probably should have been the first on the list, right? Covetousness. Craving something that's not mine and I should not have. That, that desire to grab and to take something uh, that, that is not necessarily needed in my life or planned for me to have in my life. Desiring uh, to, uh, something that I got to have more, I got to have more, I got to have more. Covetousness. Let me give you another word for covetousness. Y'all ready? Idolatry. And we all know the scriptural and the biblical warnings of idolatry. Okay? So, so, so we see this. I've got to put to flesh, my flesh to death daily. I've got to come to terms with sin daily and say, Lord, today I, I want to give you all of me. Today I, I want to kill the old man and I want to live as the new man every day of my life. It's not a one-time thing. It's not a one-time thing. Number four, when we think about the flesh. The secret lies in, be, in being able to reckon the flesh dead like God does. What does God see when he sees me? The righteousness of Christ. What do I see when I see me? My filth. My sin. The, the defeats. The time I let God down. If I'm going to get victory in my life, I've got to crucify the flesh and reckon it dead like God sees it. I've got to realize I can come to that position in my life where I, I start saying no to sin more than I do. I start saying no to temptation more than I do. Uh, you don't crucify the flesh by gratifying it. You, you, you can't uh, uh, feed the lust that enters your mind and claim to live a life that pleases the Lord. It doesn't happen. The flesh has to die, and it has to die today. And then tomorrow when I wake up, guess what? i got to kill it again. 
I got to kill it again. And, and when I've done that, then I reckon it dead to sin. I reckon it dead to the lust that leads to sin and then leads to death. Amen. And, and I look at that, my killing of my flesh, and I look at that and I try to see it the way God sees it. So instead of saying, well, ah, I look at Christ that's in my life. Christ that's a part of my life. Christ that is working through me. And I reckon it dead like God does. Number five. Number five, it all boils down to whether or not I want to please the Lord by the way I live. That's what it all boils down to. If I want victory, it boils down to I really want to please the Lord with my life. Romans chapter 8 discusses that in detail in the first 13 verses. Do I want to please God with my life? If I do, then I'm willing to deal with the flesh the way that I'm supposed to. I'm thankful that uh, there's going to come a day when the battle with the flesh will end. Amen? Amen. And when we stand before God in heaven one day, this old vile flesh is going to be changed into his likeness. Amen. Yeah, we're going to have a new body. Uh, and positionally, God says your flesh is dead to sin. Practically speaking, we need to understand it can be dead to sin if I will uh, reckon it dead and daily kill it. And one day, it will be perfectly eradicated from my life. And I will stand before God perfect and holy, new body. And the dead, the, the old, nasty, mortifying, dead, uh, ugly, uh, gross uh, uh, flesh will be gone forever. <laughs> what a day that will be, amen? <laughs> but in the present until we get there, how do I want to live my life? Uh, how do I want to live my life? Victory is preserved by death. Let me get this last thought. Uh, victory is preserved by devotion. It's preserved by devotion. The last five verses of chapter 8... The enemy had been eradicated. Victory had been preserved. Israel finished by doing what the Lord had told them to do uh, uh, through Moses. If you go back, you don't have to turn there, but if you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 20 and 7 and 28, the last five verses describe what they're doing, which they were told to do in Deuteronomy 27 and 28. Half of the nation of Israel went to Mount Ebal. Half of the nation of Israel went to Mount Gerizim. The Levites stood between them in the valley. Uh, and as they were in the valley, they read the word of God. They read the blessings of, if you do this, God will bless you. They read the cursings, if you do this, God will curse you. And, and, and by the way, if you read scripture, they didn't leave anything out. They didn't paraphrase. I'm going to give you a, a parenthesis. This is a freebie tonight, okay? They didn't look at the sundial and say, well, he sure has been going for a while. Uh, it's been 35 minutes, and I'm getting a little hungry. And, and can I just say this real quick? Because this, this, this ought to stir us all. The Bible says the children stood there and listened as well. Yeah. Yeah. Don't discount the ability of children to listen to Scripture and to listen to preaching and to sit under the man of God and to hear the Word of God and be able to apply the Word of God. Right. Okay? It's still applicable for kids and for teenagers today. Amen? Amen. <laughs> yeah. But they stood there, the Levites, they read the Word of God, the blessings and the cursings. And according to Deuteronomy 27 and 28, and then Joshua 38 as this happens in the last few verses, when the blessings were read, the, the people on this mountain would say, Amen! We like that! But when the cursings were read, the people on the other mountain said, Amen! We believe that too. And we don't want that. <laughs> we, we, want what the, we want the blessings that are being the other, the other mountains amen and about, Right? And they went back and forth, reaffirming their commitment to live by the word of God. In obedience to the command of the Lord, they made the 30, hang on a minute, the 30 mile trip to these mountains. They didn't have an Uber. Right? They didn't have a bus to get on. They didn't have a plane. They walked 30 miles for one reason. To obey what God had told them to do. And then they sat there. And they listened the entire time it took. To read that part of the word of God to them. And they amen. 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 Can I ask you a question tonight? I'm done. I know this is Sunday night. And I'm supposed to be kind and lovey dovey. And not, not preachy weechy. Right? Can I ask you a question? <laughs> Are we living by the book? The way we ought to. Can I echo what the Israelites did? Amen. I like the blessings. 
But amen, I believe the cursings as well. And those are the ones I want to avoid. Do I live by the book? Do I want lasting victory over the flesh in my life? It's going to require devotion to the word of God. That's how I preserve the victory. It's not because I got a good church. Nothing wrong with having a good church. That's great, right? Well, I got a wonderful pastor. Nothing wrong with that either. But I ain't going to do it. But, but, but I was taught. In, that's good. I'm glad you were taught in Sunday school. That's, that's always good, right? You want to preserve victory. You're going to pursue victory. You want to preserve victory. Die to the flesh. And be devoted to the word of God. And you'll see victory upon victory upon victory. Now, here's the reality tonight. And I'm looking at the crowd. I don't, I don't doubt that every, every person here tonight is saved, okay? I, I probably would give you credit for that here in our Sunday evening service. But here's what I do know. Even amongst the group of a, 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 an entire group of a church, that everybody's saved in the room. I do know this. There are people in this room, the preacher included, who struggle with the flesh. Who struggle with staying devoted to this and killing me. <laughs> we struggle. And the reality is this. When I suffer defeat in my Christian life, it is not God's fault. It always rests squarely on my shoulders. The victory is promised. I got to pursue it and I got to preserve it. Get up every day. And kill AI. Ambush that bad boy. Amen. Burn that guy to the ground. <laughs> That's what they did. Uh, death to self. Devotion to the word of God. Uh, you know. There's one thing that will guarantee us victory. And that's God. But will I follow the pattern and the formula and the prescription he's laid out for me? Israel did in chapter 8 and look at the victory they won. After just suffering the defeat before that because they didn't follow God's plan, right? Same thing works today. Same thing works today. Follow God's plan. Next week we're going to pick up in chapter 9. Oh, I want you to be here. I want you to be here next Sunday, all right? I want you to be here next Sunday. Chapter 9, being too friendly with the enemy. And we're going to look at a particular thing that takes place in Joshua's history that we would probably say, ah, I can't believe that happened, all right? But it's going to open our eyes to realize we do the same thing <laughs> many times in our life. Being too friendly with the enemy. So look at chapter 9 if you want to ahead of time. And we'll come back and we'll cover that next Sunday evening, all right? Uh, we got all our blanks filled in tonight. Oh, my. I don't have my paper or my crayon. 2C. Hang on, I can, I can scroll. 2C. They had God's performance. Did I, I think I skipped that. I totally skip point C. Let's go back. Point two. Number C. Letter C. Performance. God did it. Okay? God did. They pursued, but God did it. All right? That's pretty simple. All right? Sorry about that. You only missed it because of me. I skipped that whole point. So. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Sherry. But Alice said I could do whatever I want. She did. <laughs> Amen. You got any other blanks missed? You know, you know what really strikes me as funny? Only two people said they missed that. <laughs> Several of you did? Okay, all right. I just didn't see everybody, so. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> Cliff, Cliff's like, I ain't going to admit it because I know someone else will ask, and then I'll fill it in. Amen. Amen. All right. I don't know why. You read my mind, I guess. I don't know. It must be. You must have cheated. Did you look at the reflection of my iPad in my forehead? Yeah, maybe it was. Was it on the screen? Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. There it is. There it is. It went, yeah, I went like that and skipped it right away. I, I apologize. Let me put it up there for you. There we go. We'll leave it on that screen just so you all know what you missed. All right? <laughs> Amen. I'm glad God can take care of it. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Let's have prayer. As soon as we're done praying, I'll see if there was a question or anything like that or a comment. Uh, we'll do that once we get the video and everything stops. Let's pray together, and then we'll uh, finish up. Father, we love you tonight. We thank you again for the word of God. Thank you for its power in our lives. Thank you, Lord, that we can't have victory. We thank you, God, that you want us to have victory. 
And you promised the victory is available if we'll just pursue it and preserve it. Lord, help us to do our part in that, we pray. Help us to live for you this week, Lord, and to be good representatives of the cause of Christ. Help us to shine our lights, Lord, and glow in a sin-darkened world, we pray. And uh, we'll thank you for what you do. Bring us back on Wednesday. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. 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 All right.